Hello everyone and welcome to The Other Web. We are joined today by Professor Rafael Cohen Almagor. Professor Cohen Almagor has taught at Oxford, Tel Aviv, the Hebrew University and several other schools. He has published extensively on the fields of political science, philosophy, law and ethics. We reached out to Professor Cohen Almagor to discuss his views on the boundaries of liberty and tolerance and on free speech on the internet. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. So you've worked on a lot of very interesting topics, but the one that I would like to really focus on right now is something we see a lot in the news, which is this trade-off between free speech and objectionable speech. Since you've been writing about this topic since 1991, how do you look at this issue? What is the right framework to think about it? Free speech is extremely important. Take away free speech, take away democracy. You can't live in democracy without free speech. Granted, I'm not going to argue with that. However, it's not everything. I mean, if you don't constrict freedom, the result might be anarchy. So what we need to do is to balance against another two very important values, not just one, two very important values. One is freedom of speech and the other is social responsibility. And when you weigh this one against the other, you can see the social responsibility requires that there will be some limitations on free speech. What do you do when you have a preacher um, who believes that um, jihad is the way to purify the world and he divides the world to believers, Muslim believers and infidels, those are non-believers, and um, says that jihad requires to um, convince the infidels to convert to, to Islam, and if not, they can be killed. And he calls those people who are not willing to be converted and happen to be American because they go after him and Osama bin Laden, they call them, he called them Satan. Okay, his name is Al Alwaki. I don't, nothing is a fragment of my imagination, unfortunately. My imagination is not that great, unfortunately. Uh, the reality excels over my imagination. I was following this guy for a number of years. There was a time that when you do a Google search uh, on YouTube and you find how much uh, scope was given to him, uh, he had 64,000 entries sponsored by YouTube, American company. I found it insane. And I watched some of the uh, most graphic videos that he had to show. And you can tell just by the titles because he was quite explicit about what he wanted to do um, and what he wanted to achieve. Um, so you can, you can go directly to some of the videos just by the title and hear incitement to kill Americans. And I was watching these things, the videos, and uh, I was writing to people and to companies and try and publish articles upon articles explaining, hey, you need to do something about this. It's counter social responsibility what you're doing. You have to take your role seriously. And I was quoting directly from their own guidelines, their own regulations, saying, hey, you said that you are against violence, you're against terrorism. Just hear what al Rocky is telling you. This is violence. This is cyber to violence. And I saw connection, I showed a connection between his preaching and violent actions because his believers pursued that day. And when they were caught or killed and then went to the computers, they said either in their writings or when they were caught alive, they said that they were inspired by the preachers of al Rocky after his death. I have to say that it takes a long, long time for people to learn. But the last that I searched, I searched a couple of months ago, and now you can see that the majority of his incitement, I'm not saying all because I didn't watch all the videos that he says, I just followed the, the titles. All the problematic videos were eliminated from, from YouTube. So now it's there are sermons about, about the Quran, certain verses in the Quran, the roles of the family, the roles of women, all kind of stuff that has nothing to do with violence, which is, for me is fine, absolutely fine. But I'm very much against preaching violence and terrorism. Uh, so 
I, I'm trying to say that what you need to, to do is social responsibility. That's what you need to do. Right. So I, I do want to make that a little more specific, though, because like you mentioned Alawlaki as one example of somebody who should have been banned, but obviously wasn't. But um, right now, the Twitter files are getting published. Right. So people are going through Twitter's internal communications and publishing instances where Twitter was banning or shadow banning or limiting the reach of certain individuals. Probably one of the craziest examples I've seen from that was a professor from Stanford, Professor Jay Bhattacharya, who was tweeting about how he thinks school closures in the U.S. are ineffective during COVID. Right. And he was censored or at least his reach was limited. Because the CDC reached out to Twitter and asked to limit counter voices on COVID issues. And so at the same time that you have jihadists preaching holy war against the infidels, you have professors from Stanford whose speech is being limited just because it is outside of what the CDC considers the party line. And so is the problem an ideological commitment to free speech? Or is the problem selective enforcement when there's obviously a mechanism to limit free speech, it's just being used against the wrong people? I think both. Both are taking place and it depends on the value system and the powers that people have and the, the priorities that they see for themselves to, to, to set. Um, the things that you mentioned are extremely controversial. I mean, uh, if people believe that um, Closure is the right thing because otherwise it's going to cost you a life. It, it is a serious thing. Now you can bring me on the other hand, uh, the example of a country where I'm sitting now, Sweden, uh, that continued this freedom during COVID and believing that you know there will be some sort of herd immunity and it's, it's going to be sorted out uh, on, it, on its own. I'm not sure which model is the correct model. I, I do not know. But I agree with you that um, these are very controversial issues. And certainly there is an agenda for people and those who hold the vines of power can, can use that power as they see fit. That's correct. And I guess the concern specifically with the Twitter files was that it wasn't even a particular company making that decision, in a sense. There was an FBI team of 80 agents that were selectively reporting tweets to them, asking them to remove specific things. So it was, in some sense, government enforcing limits to free speech, albeit without making an actual law, right? Um, so let me try to think about how you can potentially solve it. Obviously, legislation that places limits on the things that you mentioned. We have some of it, incitement to violence, child pornography are already banned, right? But maybe in the examples that you bring, some more legislation could provide additional limits. But what should a company do given that they operate in a certain climate with certain legislation? Should they come up with their own limits that go beyond the legislation? Should they just follow the law and that's it? What would your recommendation be? I reverse the order. For me, legislation is the last resort. As a liberal, I, I rather not have legislation if I can avoid this. So, so for me, it's the last thing that I want is to, to legislate. I, I start from, from the beginning as, as liberals do. So we start with communication, you continue with education, you converse, you try to deliberate, deliberative democracy, you try to persuade, you come to terms to negotiations with these companies, with Twitter, with Google, with uh, Facebook, with Instagram, with all these mega companies. You explain to them the wrong that they are part of, whether they want it or not. I'm not saying that they do this intentionally. I think that oftentimes it's a matter of costs and they like to save costs. And the result is that. Um, so I just bring them the data and I say, well, this is what we see as a result of your policy, what can you change? And then if they agree to, to make some changes, then they are going to consolidate some regulations they upon themselves, self-regulation. In the self-regulations, they're going to put it in such a wording that is not going to open too much for interpretations, hopefully. And there will be a mechanism that people can protest if there's any qualms 
about the implementation of the regulation. So you, you, you put it as well. And the complaints can be either for inactivity or overactivity. So both can be, people can complain about. And it's very important that these companies would be loyal to their regulations to put it just on the paper as lip service and then just ignore that that's of course not very effective. Actually it's going to signal to those people who want to do harm that it's a, it's a free play for them, you know, free ground. They can do whatever they want because nobody cares. So they not they need to to abide by their own regulation. If this does not work, then the responsibility is on other players. And I say this is a responsibility of users, people like you, like you and me. Now, what we are doing now, we are using the internet in order to propagate certain ideas, to advance certain ideas. So it is our responsibility that we, when we see something, we can speak about this as exactly what I do now. I speak against this kind of speeches. Um, responsibility of readers. I don't post anything. I just read. But if I encounter something that is highly problematic, I should complain about this. So there's also the reader's responsibility. There's the responsibility of the state legislation. So this is when self-regulation doesn't work, there should be an outer regulation and that's either the state or the international community. And all of us as a global community, because we're talking about the global arena, internet is global, everyone is connected more or less, then all of us have to tackle issues that we believe are important for our well-being for our security, for our children. And then we'll do it together, and then we can introduce change. That's the way that I would go about it. Okay, so that sounds like a great framework. I sort of agree with all of the different boxes, and I want to dive into each box a little bit to make sure that we understand each one. So one is coming up with essentially terms of service, and then people being able to complain when those terms of service are not being enforced correctly. One of the issues that we see today is that people are only able to complain in one direction. If something should be taken down and wasn't, you see it so you can complain. But if something was taken down or its reach was limited in some way, you cannot see it. And so you cannot complain. All you can do is shout, I think I should appear in search more, and but it seems like I'm censored, right? But you don't actually know this because there's no transparency in the actual process that is being applied. So should some sort of transparency, whether it's just keeping the records and making them open to Freedom of Information Act, or should all regulation essentially be done using open source software so people can see exactly what is being done? What is the way to structure this so that people can actually complain when they disagree with something? I entered the book. The book is called Confronting the Internet Dark Side. Um... I ended the book with a proposal and I want to share with you my proposal and this is will be an answer also to your, to your question. So what I have in mind is a very affluent person. So I don't want the state to be involved in that because when the state is involved, they might be abused. I don't want the state to be there, but I want to, to have an individual, you know, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, someone like this with, billions of dollars that he can spend as, a, as in something that he believes. And I said he, because all of them are men for some reason. Um, and this person would believe in free speech as Elon Musk believes, but also believe in social responsibility as I do believe, and in the balance. And this guy would say, I would like to create a new browser. I call it CleanNet. And um, on this browser, we are going to decide, we, through mechanism of deliberative democracy, we are going to decide what things are not going to be on the net. So when I browse, I would not be able to find them. And for this purpose, what I suggested is to establish a citizens committee. Sometimes they are established, you know, in health care, welfare states, they establish citizens committee. But this one will be international. And I say 400 people. 400 people who will be uh, people who are human rights activists, uh, free speech activists, uh, people who believe in social responsibility, technological people, educators, um, legislators, politicians, diplomats, the crop of the crop, people who have done something in their life. We assemble them together 
and we tell them, you now think, and you can you have budgets, you can do polls, whatever. I want you to create certain issues that you agree upon by consensus, if possible, by a majority, if not possible, on the things that should be excluded from the internet. That if I'll try, I will not be able to find them. I mean, if I'm criminal, I'll go to the dark web, I'll be able to find anything I want. But most of us are not criminals. So I'm talking about those of us who are decent uh, human beings, citizens of the world. And we are going to agree. I can assume, that's just an assumption, that issues like uh, terrorism and child pornography would not be included in the in clean ads. Uh, that's my assumption. And then you develop certain algorithm, and there are people who will be able to develop these algorithms. They do it all the time. Um, that after we agreed on the, the items that should be excluded, this algorithm is going to filter out any kind of mentioning of those things. And then there will be also a mechanism to complain if I stopped you, for instance, because I thought that you are uh, inciting to terrorism you, and you don't, I, you can complain and we are going to review this. Not the same committee, there's going to be another committee that is dealing with complaints. So they, they, they can handle this issue. And this will be voluntary. CleanNet will be voluntary. So meaning that you'll be on your screen, you'll have Safari and you'll have uh, other, other browsers that, that, that come about. Firefox, whatever, but we'll have also clean net. And then we start pumping this clean net. So for instance, we come, and we come to engage with governments and tell them, why do you think that in schools, for instance, people should be versed about everything? I mean, are, are there certain issues that you don't want them to be versed about children? Terrorism, child pornography, for instance. Here you are, you have clean net. That's something that you should push forward. You come to businesses and said, do you think it's a good idea that uh, your employees are going to be uh, surfing terrorism and child pornography or racism or cyberbullying or whatever? You decided the thing. I believe that many companies said, no, I don't think that we actually are. Our employees should have anything to this. We deal with tax, we deal with commerce, we deal with education, God knows what, but no, there's no reason for that. And then there will be Give and take governments when they do press conferences, whatever, or they when they want to issue calls, they're going to issue it via the browser that is called CleanNet. And this way you're going to create citizens of the world that cooperating together the, in a responsible way to allow free speech along with social responsibility and have a secure sphere in which people and parents don't have to worry too much where the children are going. And as long as we have this commitment and understanding that there is this balance, then we can create a new reality. This is my belief. That's what I would like to aspire to. So I guess as an engineer, I have to immediately ask, how is this substantially different from using any other browser, but using parental controls, right? So today I can change my DNS to something like OpenDNS and tell it to basically block any website that fits any of these categories, weapons, gambling, porn, any of these things, I would end up within Chrome or Safari with something that looks a lot like CleanNet, I think. Yeah, absolutely. But it's going to be Alex's home and business. I'm talking about the global phenomenon. No, but, but my point is the implementation of this browser, even on a global level, is basically any existing browser with open DNS instead of their existing DNS server, right? Um, so the implementation is almost trivial. We already have that. I think the interesting thing you're proposing is instead of Cisco deciding what is pornography and blocking it because they own open DNS, we would have a committee redefining it and on an ongoing basis, right? No, I don't think I don't think that you got me right. No, it's not that. First of all, as I said, it's it's voluntary, so you can either subscribe to it or not. Once you subscribe to it, you are going to, to use only clean net. So all the items that are effectively will be transparent, all the items that are excluded, you know that are excluded, you have to sign for it. You don't have to tailor it for each your family, for your children, whatever. It's already designed. The beauty about this is that it's all true conversation, debate, and deliberative democracy. People are conversing, people are debating, people can complain. 
there is transparency. All the things that you're worried about, the lack of transparency, I also want the algorithms to be out. I want it to be everything that will be in the out, in the open, so people know exactly what, we, what they are doing. That's what I want to be on the table. And then I'm employing together, it's going to be a civil act together. I'm taking the technology together with human rights activists, with legal minds together, with families, and bring them all together to decide what are the elements that we want to exclude. And all the rest is going to be allowed. Let me ask you, is there a distinction between original content and secondary content in this world? So let's say I write an article that is original. We apply whatever rules the clean net applies to decide whether it's in or out. How do we then address people who are commenting on the article, discussing the article, forwarding the article to each other? Is there a way to address that in some way? Because it could be that the article is benign. But the first comment to it is some form of hate speech. Okay, so I said, I think, I hope that the algorithm is going to track this down and be excluded. And if it doesn't, then people are free to complain about this comment and say that it should be excluded. Uh, when people would believe that actually there's going to be action as a result, and the action will be in the immediate, because one thing that I don't want to compromise is the issue of the content. This is something I'm not willing to compromise. That's why I want someone who is really affluent because the obstacle now for um, companies like Facebook is actually to put into work thousands of people that are going to monitor the algorithm, monitor the internet. They don't do it because it's costly to them. I want to put the people in, in place. You know, in China, I don't know the numbers, but people told me between one and 50,000 to, to, to quarter of a million, people do and just inspect the internet every day. I'm not going to go there. I don't think that we need that numbers and I think technology can do far more than, than we can do now if we have decided our priorities and if we're going to do it right. But I think it's possible to filter that. And if we are going to do that in the way that I perceive in democratic, deliberative, socially responsible way, I think that we can get good results. So there will be some abuses, I mean, and it's, nothing is bulletproof, but I think that we'll get a better and more secure internet. But I don't think that it's going to be a global internet because if you listen to me carefully, I told you that I'm motivated by liberal values and liberal values is, goes that far. I mean, not all countries in the world subscribe to, to liberal theory. So I can see that there will be countries like China, for instance, that are go not going to subscribe to clean net. They are not going to believe in that or Iran or whatever. They would think that uh, it's not enough or it's too much, God knows what, but it's going to be different. They, they will be out. I mean, in my, in my mind, as I read the map and I try you know, to envision the future is difficult, but I don't think, I mean, one possibility is that I can certainly envisage is that we are not going to have global internet. We are going to have internets. And we see to some extent already it is happening because, you know, Russia monitors its internet and China monitors its internet. So it's not something that would be beyond the pale of imagination. It can happen that there will be internet only for liberal democracies. And then the values that we appreciate will find the common denominator. Of the four issues that trouble me the most, I think three are agreed upon. One is disagreed, and the one country that disagrees is the United States, and that's about hate speech, because in the United States you can hate anybody and everybody as much as you want. It's the only democracy in the world that has a, a live Nazi party. No other democracy has Nazi parties, United States has because they believe in this absolute freedom. Well, so I think that, again, in practice, that doesn't actually happen in many ways, right? A lot of people get banned for hate speech on many of these platforms. We actually have a very live discussion in the US about hate speech and the fact that it is over applied and not under applied, right? So it is obviously not applied to some things that it should be applied to, but there are a lot of things called hate speech and a lot of people being banned for hate speech that are really just political disagreements. And we see that all over the place. So I think 
the statement that the U.S. does not care about hate speech or has essentially unlimited tolerance to it. Maybe that was true at some point. We are pretty far from that point. Well, we have to differentiate. There's, there's the state and the, the companies that are not the same entity. I think the state, the United States, is very committed to, to free speech, very much committed to free speech. And according to many people with whom I converse every day on these issues, they believe in free speech and they apply free speech. And they say you can hate anybody and everybody, and they don't see the connection between hate speech and hate crime. They don't see that. What you describe are companies that are abusing their power to stop certain people who propagate certain ideas they don't like. This is abusing the power. But that's not the United States. These are companies. That, these are two different things. The United States is a place where everybody can hate everybody. And there's a lot of hatred. I do not do research about what you are concerned about. I'm not concerned. I, I you know, I have limited time. So I'm not doing everything that, you, that I should do, maybe. But I'm not concerned about people that are ousted from the internet because, uh, because of abuse of the power of the companies. I am very much concerned about blatant um, bigots and racists and racist organization that say vile things that motivates and incite other people to kill people. This is my concern. And unfortunately, and I've been following these things since the, the early 90s, they are alive and kicking. And I continue to publish articles. I think the most recent ones was about 2017 that showed organizations, American organizations that live under the First Amendment and they incite to violence against minorities, people they don't like, against African-Americans, against Jews, against homosexuals, against Muslims, against women. They don't like them. And they incite violence against them. And they're allowed to do that under the First Amendment. That's United States. The same speeches would not be allowed in Europe. In Europe, there are different values that are coming to competition. For instance, the dignity of the person. It's a European term that appears in Europe and hardly seen and conversed in the United States. When you pit together the dignity of the person and free speech, you can understand that there's a fierce competition here. So there is hate speech legislation in many countries in the world. There's none in the United States. In the United States, it would require a constitutional amendment to really make that as comprehensive as it is in Europe, right? Yeah. yeah. As long as the First Amendment believes in what in the free speech, then, then we have it. And unfortunately, you have the First Amendment and then you have the Second Amendment, the right to self-defense and to bear arms. And they go very well together. So first you propagate to kill someone and then you take a gun or someone takes a gun and actually go and kill them. And in the first, in the last three days, I think you had three or four incidents of mass killings and mass shootings. So it's, I think it's a real problem. United States is paying very high price for its values. All right. I want to go back to your vision of the clean net because our podcast is called Other Web and the Other Web is an actual place on the web. It's not a browser, right? But it's a website and a set of apps that is actually, in a sense, creating a cleaner version of at least some subset of the net. It's a cleaner version of the news. It's a cleaner version of commentary on the news. It's a cleaner version of a few other elements. And I am thinking, among other things, how to grow that to encompass more and more of the net. And our algorithms are source available because we do want people to look at them and comment on them as much as possible. But I guess the question is, how can this be grown or should it be grown to really encompass everything? Or if there are multiple internets anyway, then there should also be multiple walled gardens, this one relating to the news only, this one relating to gaming only, etc. Does it make sense for the entire clean net to be in one place? Or if there's fragmentation, should it just be as fragmented as possible? Well, I, th I think that it will be a great idea if we have clean net for the liberal, for liberal democracies. I think it's something that it can be done if there will be someone with the vision and the money to, to put their heart together and, and do it. I think it is doable. It is doable technologically. Uh, I think that many people underestimate the power of technology. Actually, almost anything that you want to do technologically, you, you can do when you, once you put your mind into that. It's, it is possible. So the idea is, is doable. You can, you can do that. Um, I don't like to say that my values are necessarily uh, universal. 
not because I don't believe that they are universal. I think they are, I do believe they are universal, but also sociologically speaking, just realistically speaking, I understand that Iran doesn't espouse my values, that China doesn't espouse my values. They show this to me every day in the way that they're not tolerating people with different ways of life and different convictions. So I don't think that I'll be able to convince them. So it's out of necessity of just empirically speaking, watching reality, I understand that are going to be different internets. But I'm not happy with the internet now. I'm really not happy. I think that there's a much of abuse of free speech. I think there's a lot of speech that is vile and harmful, that is antisocial. I think this is the price that we pay because it's so young. I mean, the internet came to our existence, to our vocabulary, to our way of life, only around 1993, 1994. So in historical terms, whether you believe this planet exists for 140 million years or even for 5,000 years, we are in infancy. It's less than 50 years old. So we are in the education care. We are learning how to live with the internet. I don't want to go back to life before the internet. I mean, I'm a dinosaur. I live the majority of my life without the internet. I value the internet greatly. I understand how valuable it is. I don't want to go back, but I think that we need to develop ways that will put the internet to the maximum use and at the same time responsibly. That's what I want. I think now we are paying the price because of the infancy, because it's a young toddler. So we don't know how to work with it. This is why in the infancy, even when it was even younger, say in 2000, or 2005, there was far more terrorism, far more hatred, far more child pornography, far more incitement than is now. People do learn. These companies do learn. Let me say a few words about cyberbullying. All the phenomena aggravate me, but you know, if there is a phenomena that can be stopped almost immediately or reduced drastically almost immediately is a cyberbullying. And this aggravates me the most because we now have the information, we have the data, we know what's going on. It is possible for mega companies like Facebook and Instagram to stop it and they don't know enough. The result is that each and every year, we have dozens of people, usually between the ages of 11 to 21. This is the age that the personality has been formulated and people are insecure. They move from childhood to adulthood. They don't, know how to deal with pressure. They're ashamed of being victims, so they don't tell, they become silent, they absorb all this hatred into them, and then they don't know how to get out of it, and the solution for them is suicide. And I, for one, think it's a shame because these companies can do far more to stop it. They have the algorithm, they can stop it. When it starts, they can stop it and say, no, it cannot continue. This abuse cannot continue because it might lead to someone who's taking his life. And they simply don't care. No, no, not care enough. Whereas when it comes to copyrights, if you try to put song of someone and you take all the lyrics, you take the music and you publish it your own without any co in clear violation of copyrights, you'll be deleted immediately. Within five minutes, you'll be away. You'll be taken off. So when it comes to economy and there's a price tag, the companies are doing what they need to do. When it comes to taking young life, they don't care or don't care enough. And that's something that I, I'm really, really uh, angry about uh, because we, uh, as a community, as parents, we pay a very high price because of that um, sense of irresponsibility. And here I put also to the fray another concept that's extremely important, which is corporate social responsibility. To understand that actually it is good for your business to do things in a responsible, honest, decent way. It's not going to harm you if you invest in your own people, in your own community, in your own democracy. You're going to earn from it. I mean, because of this democracy, because of this uh, community, you are making money. 
So at least do it in a responsible way. And unfortunately, we know that not all companies are advocating and adopting corporate social responsibility norms. And that's, that's, that's really, really sad. I, am, uh, I feel that we can live in a better world. And we can live in a better world when we come to uh, act responsibly, not only speaking about this, not only put regulations up there for people to read, because none of us actually read, you know, you need to approve the terms and conditions. Who has the time or energy to read these small letters that goes on and sometimes, you know, for a minute, one after one page, nobody reads them. The issue is not to put it on paper and then ignore this. The issue is to put it on paper and then adapt and implement this. And it is doable if people are going to understand that with power comes responsibility and with great power comes great responsibility. They can do that and they should do that. And if they don't do that, then it's our role as citizens, it is our responsibility to convey the message to them that they should. We can penalize them. And we as customers, we have power and we've seen it in the past when we decided as customers that there are certain agendas that we like to pursue, say climate, climate change or Me Too, and we ban certain companies because they're racist or whatever, we can do that and people can lose a lot of money because of irresponsible behavior. So it's not only up to them, it's up to all of us, citizens of this world. We can come together and create a better planet, better planet on the internet, better planet as such when it comes to global warming, just better way of life. Seems like an ending I cannot top. So I think we will end on that positive and hopeful note. Thank you so much, Professor. I really appreciate you joining us and helping us understand these big topics. This has been another episode of The Other Web. Join us next week for more discussions on information, knowledge, and the ecosystem that makes it all possible.